नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू सनसेट टेलीविजन आई एम विशाल दहिया एंड यू वाचिंग आर शो पर्सपेक्टिव वे विल ब्रिंग यू डिटेल्ड एनालिसिस ऑफ की नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल इश्यूज टुडे वी गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द टेंशंस इन कोरियन पेनिनसुला नाउ नॉर्थ कोरिया लॉन्च्ड टू मोर बैलिस्टिक मिसाइल्स ऑफ इट्स ईस्ट कोस्ट ऑन मंडे विद स्टेट न्यूज एजेंसी केसीएनए कोटिंग द पावरफुल सिस्टर ऑफ नॉर्थ कोरियन लीडर किम जोंग उन सेइंग प्योंगयांग्स यूज ऑफ द पैसिफिक एज इट्स फायरिंग रेंज वुड एंटायरली डिपेंड ऑन द यूएस फोर्सेस एक्शन कैरेक्टर नाउ दीस लॉन्चेस कम just two days after north korea fired an intercontinental ballistic missile that is icbm into the sea of japan's west coast uh, prom- prompting the united states to hold joint air exercises with south korea and separately with japan as well on sunday while japanese prime minister fumio kishida requested an emergency united nations security council meeting over the test south korea's joint chief of staff strongly condemned the launches as a grave provocation that should be ceased immediately so we'll try and understand a bit more about uh, these tensions in the korean peninsula why is it happening and what's the way out uh, how serious is the escalation this time around and for more on this we joined by a distinguished panel of experts let me first uh, introduce them to you beginning with we have in the studio uh, mr karthik uh, bomakanti is a senior fellow with orf uh, welcome mr bomakanti to our studios uh, prit pal choudhury uh, foreign affairs editor with hindustan times is also joining us and uh, so is former mr uh, manjeev singh puri as well uh, welcome both of you gentlemen as well uh, I'll begin with you, Karthik, and let's you know first start by understanding a few basic points here. This is not the first time that uh, you know this sort of crisis, uh, which has been uh, you know led by a missile test by North Korea, has happened in the Korean Peninsula. But what's the genesis? You know, why does it keep on happening year after year? We see, uh, and in fact, in uh, last year, there is in 2022, there were uh, a large number of missile tests which were carried by North Korea. Yeah, certainly the tests conducted by North Korea. are not new these tests are also not new what is most important to recognize as you said is why it happens over and over again and the deeper reason for that is because the north has no source of leverage its only two sources of leverage are its nuclear weapons program and its missile program and they are invaluable tools of coercion they knock the south koreans of balance they knock the they knock the japanese of balance and apart that apart the americans who are their close allies it knocks them off balance and that's one way of you know not just uh, keeping them off balance but it also allows them to remind the rest of the world that it can that north korea has the capacity to also refine and improve its capabilities and it can target places well beyond the korean peninsula including the american mainland mm mm-hmm. okay okay so there lies the genesis part there uh, will uh, dwell more into this as well uh, ambassador puri i'd like to bring you in here you know your views on on why this keeps on happening and also for us to better understand how serious is the escalation this time around you will have to unmute yourself sir i was muted apology vishal thank you very much i think our colleague has stretched to you the kind of situations that the north korea a find themselves and b have put themselves in having said that the fact remains why now why not after 10 days why not after 15 days whenever look in my understanding one is this entire issue that you know there are domestic uh, political kind of things within the family mr kim himself asserting himself showing off now his daughter his sister coming to the fore and there are various issues of that particular kind with someone who's an expert would be able to understand that the second are various issues dealing with the united states upping its ante in the far eastern part part as a result of chinese hegemonistic moves aukas and all of these particular things now are the chinese egging the north koreans i'm not so sure but i won't be very much surprised if you know there was a little bit of saying yes you know you do this thirdly there are this entire dimension that the united states is occupied somewhere but it's also acting up in the in the far east side and the north koreans you know want to uh, sort of tell the south koreans and everyone that look we are a force we are a force to reckon with and you know don't sort of trifle with us and and take us into the sea mm-hmm. remember one more point and i'm making these points you know more as a, as a kind of question why it's happened uh, a few years back before president biden came to the to power mr trump had actually reached out to the north koreans Yes. Now think of yourself from the perspective of a leader like uh, the North Korean leader, who's been shunned by everyone, 
who suddenly finds that himself he is being fated and called to a meeting by Donald Trump and now suddenly it's back to the old things that, you know, forget about this guy, keep him on one side. So is it all of that? You know, this needs somebody who's very familiar with the psychology, mm -hmm. the psychosis and the way of their thinking. But, you know, I would say these things have happened in the past. These things will continue to happen in the past, but they are serious and we should take them with due seriousness because the North Koreans are now developing their missile program as well as their nuclear capability. And this is certainly a serious point. Okay, okay. Uh, Pramit, uh, you know, uh, your assessment of the situation and also, uh, would you agree with what uh, Mr. Puri is, is pointing out there that, you know, uh, perhaps uh, you, you uh, call the uh, North Korean leader to the uh, table for talks, di discussion, dialogue, and then shun him again. So uh, the other guy has no leverage, uh, but to, you know, display its uh, force in terms of missile tests. So, yeah, first I'll point out that we've seen a steady, should we say, acceleration in North Korea's missile program. Uh, if you look at the number of tests that were held last year, uh, it was a staggering number by North Korean standards. In fact, 25% of all the North Korean missile launches in history were all carried out just last year. In addition, on February 9th, we saw the North Koreans hold a military parade uh, where they showed, again, the largest number of ICBMs they've ever done before. Over a dozen ICBMs were, were paraded uh, along Pyongyang. And we saw Kim Jong-un make a speech where he declared that there would be an exponential increase uh, in the number of nuclear missiles, uh, the nuclear arsenal of North Korea in the coming year. And not just these long-range missiles that we're talking about. He, in particular, seemed to have pointed out that tactical nuclear missiles would also be part of what he was planning to do. Mm -hmm. That's important because, effectively, those are not for display or show. Those are missiles that are designed for actual warfare, uh, uh, land warfare. Um, we've seen North Korea become, it's already very close to China, but align itself in many ways much, much more towards uh, Beijing and, and to some degree Moscow uh, in its language, in its overall foreign policy over the past several months. Um, all of this points to a North Korea that doesn't see, should we say, much, doesn't seem to feel it has to have much advance uh, gain from really going out of its way on negotiations. As has been mentioned, since, what, 2019, there have been no discussions uh, between of any consequence between the US and North Korea or between any of the countries in Northeast Asia. Um, my instinct would be that given the kind of tests he's doing um, and the language he's giving, Kim Jong-un is indicating he's actually not all that interested in negotiations right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are probably there does seem to be some economic issues in North Korea because of sanctions. But uh, given that its border with China is open and given China's uh, economic capacities, uh, North Korea, I don't think, has much to worry uh, on that front or is not worried about that front. Mm -hmm. It used to, in the past, try to play off um, its negotiations with the United States and, the, and, and, it, and an opening up to Japan or South Korea. Okay. Uh, to at least reduce its dependence on China. It was close to China, but it didn't always need to want to become completely dependent on China. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be that interested in going down that path anymore. So my expectation is that we will see more such missile launches, we will see more such language. And overall, uh, as Ambassador Puri's mentioned, we will see a far greater degree of tension in Northeast Asia, not just because of this, uh, but because of the language we're seeing over Taiwan, mm -hmm. but also keep in mind the Japanese announcement of a new defense strategy, Indeed. which will effectively remilitarize Japan. Okay. Ambassador Puri, uh, you wanted to say something? Uh... No, uh, thank you, Vishan. I very much agree with what uh, Pramit has just put out, this business of what else is happening there. Now, you know, Chinese hegemony has resulted in even those who had pacifist ideas in their constitution, like Japan, etc., coming to the fore. And naturally, the United States is becoming more cognizant of what we like to call Indo-Pacific, but let's say the Far East, mm -hmm. uh, using old uh, things, the AUKO strategy, etc. And so, therefore, to look at 
from people like uh, Kim Jong-un, etc., from North Korea, and they're coming to the fore and, you know, both asserting themselves as some kind of players, which they are because of their possession of missile and nuclear technology. But also, you know, let me say, putting forward the point that, you know, it isn't such a simple matter. There is There are lots of other power players which are involved, and this game is not such a straightforward one. Okay. Uh, I think these are all dangerous portents for the future. And therefore, I very much agree with what Pramit has said. You will continue to see all of this going up. It's been ratcheted up and it will, I'm afraid, continue. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that part as well. But uh, uh, Kathik here, you know, uh, to understand a bit more the, the, the gravity of the situation, uh, seriousness uh, of, of the tensions, the prevailing tensions in Korean Peninsula, we all have to understand a few aspects which all of you have pointed out. One, uh, North Korea is a nuclear uh, powered nation, nuclear armed nation. That's one. Two, it's a very, uh, you know, secretive country. Not much uh, is known about the kind of strategies they deploy or the kind of, you know, uh, decisions they take uh, based on what uh, discussions they hold. Uh, autocratic regime, of course. The other part being uh, the fact that, you know, there are other powers as well. It's not just, uh, you know, Japan, South Korea, United States, as, as both the other panelists are pointing out, uh, China and Russia are also uh, players, perhaps uh, behind the scenes as of now, but yes, they are. Yes, absolutely. I mean, North Korea serves as a very important proxy for both of them. Given the kind of alignment there is between China and, the, and Russia today, uh, North Korea plays a very, very pivotal role in terms of its capacity to, you know, destabilize the region, keep all of China's adversaries, at least within the sub-region of Northeast Asia, off balance and remind them that regardless of their efforts to build up their capabilities, as the ambassador and Mr. Chaudhary have, and Dr. Chaudhary have pointed out, uh, that you know, Japan has revised its military policy. It is in the process of building up its capabilities. It's, going, it's raised defense spending significantly. These factors weigh a lot on what the North Koreans are doing. And they have been egged on and certainly encouraged by Beijing and Moscow very likely to, you know, carry out these tests. Okay. And uh, they will continue to do so. And they, if they test again nuclear weapons, I mean, uh, nuclear devices, that will be certainly intended, as, as Mr. Chaudhary has pointed out, towards developing tactical nuclear weapons because they would get a more refined and a more capable uh, nuclear okay. arsenal. Okay, so more leverage uh, yeah, North yeah, Korea holds, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the better it is. That's mm -hmm. what uh, their strategy mm -hmm. seems to be. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the more uh, elbow room or maneuvering yeah. power out yeah. there. Yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Puri, you know, one more aspect since you mentioned uh, the Indo-Pacific out there. And when we look at it from India's perspective, let's let's try and understand it from that perspective because, because there's another, you know, uh, multilateral form uh, quad wherein two of the uh, member nations of the quad are the countries which are involved in this crisis uh, to a very close uh, extent, Japan, whose Prime Minister has asked for a, you know, uh, emergency session of the UN Security Council. United States, uh, against whom North Korea's entire, uh, you know, IRA seems to be aimed at. You are absolutely right. I mean, uh, these are countries which are Pacific parts. And, you know, their proximity to North Korea, proximity to China, these are extremely important. Now, you know, let's look at it from the Indian perspective, quite apart from flare-ups in the Far East or in the Indo-Pacific region. Let's also remember one thing. North Korea has been a purveyor of its technology, including in our neighborhood. And so if they start perfecting these kinds of things, whether it's missiles, tactical nuclear weapons, etc., and then become uh, conduits for kind of proliferating these, what does it mean for our own security? This is a country where its development of these particular technologies is really out of the ambit of whatever rules space. I know India is not a member of the NPT and neither are the P5, etc. But, you know, outside the general purview of what is under some kind of umbrella, some kind of willingness, at least voluntarily by the countries to abide by the general rules of the way. And so, therefore, these are all extremely important matters. And for us, it can't be a matter of simply looking and saying, look, it's far away from us. It doesn't matter. It's what they do with their technologies and the fact that they are now refining these technologies, moving into areas where, frankly, there are very few countries in the world which are in the possession of such technologies, which are lethal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, and also, you know, going going further ahead, uh, Ambassador Puri, 
do you see a, a diplomatic uh, way out of this entire crisis or, or is that something which uh, given the kind of statements which are coming in from North Korea and the kind of responses from uh, both uh, South Korea and Japan out there, uh, is there a room for any diplomatic uh, dialogue there? Possibility as it happened in 2019 with the talks between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un? Uh, Vishal, you know, I don't know. Sometimes things just happen. Let's look at the UN Security Council. At the end of the day, it would be the Russians and the Chinese willing to go along, isn't it? Now, in general, we would say they would not allow North Korea to be condemned or huge more sanctions levied on them. But, you know, you never know what kind of games they are willing to play vis-a-vis -vis the Western country. And they might just go along some kind of a resolution. I don't know the answer because these really rest in the realm of their own understanding of their situation, their foreign policy compulsions, and more than that, what is it and how is it that they look at it in terms of domestic politics? Now, the United States and its situation vis-a-vis -vis China has undergone a number of series. This balloon business cannot be underestimated because it was people in the United States who saw them, and there was reactions of that is that kind. So, as simple as that. The uh, President Biden is now preparing for the 2024 election. You see this happening all around. So we don't know exactly the way they will react. Okay. But you're talking about diplomacy. You know, Kim Jong is a very difficult um, person to be able to diplomatically tackle. Having said this, how can I, coming from where I am, saying that attempts should not be made? And these attempts need to be both formal as well as informal. And frankly speaking, if it is possible to do, even under the Chen circumstances, to ask the Chinese to step on. I heard uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken mention something of this kind on the television last mm -hmm. night. And I sincerely hope that these kind of leverages are done vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. The U.S., China and those issues are separate. Try and keep them separate. Okay. But a degree of reaching out and talking to them is particularly important because the portents otherwise can be dangerous even if just accident. Okay, okay. Pramit, uh, you know, uh, how do you see uh, the road to de-escalation? Uh, of course, uh, you and earlier uh, Mr. Puri have also pointed out, Karthik has also referred to it, that North Korea would not want to miss any opportunity to, you know, uh, sort of uh, flex it mus its muscles and that might lead to further tensions. But de-escalation process when we talk about in the backdrop of the fact that the uh, you know, the relations between United States and China and the United States and uh, Russia are frosty at, at, at this moment. Yes, right now, it's, I wouldn't say that there seems to be very any likelihood of much happening. Uh, one, is the North Korean government is a conservative government. President Yoon is not, uh, has taken a hard line, a reasonably hard line on North Korea's actions. Uh, just after this missile test, I believe they've just imposed a set of sanctions against uh, five entities and, and and a bunch of individuals in North Korea. Traditionally, it's been the left liberal coalition governments, uh, got parties in, when they're in power, that try to take a softer line uh, on North Korea. Uh, we have to see, my sense is that we will see North Korea carry out more such tests and then find out what exactly do they want to get out of this. Do they want to use this as the basis for some sort of negotiations or concessions, are they doing it with uh, with a wink and an eye, uh, a wink and a nudge from Beijing, China, telling them cause some problems in this neighborhood to remind the Americans and the Japanese that without us they cannot stabilize stabilize this region, mm -hmm. um, or are they just even trying to, or, or are they genuinely trying to develop a, a, a new generation of weapons? Uh, one of the things we have to watch out for, they, they, the North Koreans in this test announced that this was a, a sudden test, an attempt to test their capacity to launch uh, with, with minimal warning, uh, which, is a, which is a kind of thing you do in preparation for war. It's not a type of thing you do in just preparation for just developing uh, a program. If they carry out more such tests, including tactical training on the ground with nuclear weapons or tactical, then it would be an actually a very dangerous sign because it would indicate what they are developing is war preparedness, mm -hmm. military capacity to actually fight as opposed to just having a attempt to show what they could do, uh, okay. which would be a very, which is uh, more traditional and less of a concern.
Okay, okay. Uh, Karthik, you know, a final question to you in terms of the way forward. And uh, we have to look at all the factors here. Uh, the kind of statements which have come in from North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un's sister, you know, saying that uh, its actions will depend upon uh, the U.S. Defense Forces' action character. That is what they do in response to these kind of tests. That is one, two Japanese prime ministers seeking a, a, you know, emergency session of the United Nations Security Council. And if you look at other actors here, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the kind of uh, relation which as of now exists between uh, United States and Russia and U.S. and China as well uh, over uh, uh, Ukraine, Taiwan, balloon issue as well. Uh, not, not everything is hunky-dory here. No, no, it's not. The only thing is that as of now, I don't believe there is much traction, at least, to see something done to tamp down some of those tensions. I think the North will persist with what it's doing right now. And it's also not conducive to bring about some kind of uh, a diplomatic effort that would at least uh, reduce tensions. Most likely what will happen is that there will be pressure when President Biden does uh, visit and when President Biden is, is in the middle of an election year. But when he does meet again with his Chinese counterpart, he will try and remind him about the importance of you know, keeping some of these tensions down. But apart from that, I don't see any change really happening anytime soon, at least not in the immediate future. Down the line, perhaps they could be under some pressure from Moscow and even from Beijing and the North Koreans could tamp it down. But as of now, I don't believe there can be there's okay. going to be much change. Okay, but but yeah. another factor is with yeah. Japan upping their interview with, with you know its defense preparedness. Yeah, it's that defense, against complicates yeah, the situations that, further. Yeah, it does complicate the situation simply because it's a new variable today, uh, and it's a new variable even for the Chinese because now they have to confront a more assertive Japan which they haven't faced since World War Two, mm -hmm. really, or at least since the Communist Party came to power in China. So they are faced with a completely new reality. And China is the big player, is the biggest player there apart from the US in the region. So now if Japan starts to, you know, become the kind of power it is and become the kind of military power that is commensurate to its economic strength, then of course it presents a new dynamic altogether okay. for the region. Okay, okay. So there it is. That sums up the entire situation. Thank you so mm. much, Karthik. Uh, and Mr. Puri there as well. And uh, Pramit, you also. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your valued uh, inputs out there to try and make us understand uh, the... Uh, reasons behind the tensions in the Korean Peninsula. It's not the first time that uh, North Korea has uh, fired its uh, missiles or uh, test fired its missiles uh, over Japan and uh, South Korea into the Pacific Ocean. But this time around, uh, Japan has sought uh, the emergency session of uh, United Nations Security Council and uh, we'll keep a close track of all the developments there and keep on bringing you the detailed analysis uh, on this as well as several other topics. Till then, keep watching Sunset Television. Thank you.